just for folks signing in, welcome. We hope that you are safe today. Um, we're just going to let wait a few more minutes to make sure that everyone to get logged in is logged in. Just gonna wait a couple more minutes, everyone. Thanks for being patient. Still seeing some action as people join the room. Okay. Uh, I am uh, delighted to welcome everyone here today. Um, we are delighted to have you join us for this important event. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge uh, that the NSDSW is in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, whose inherent rights were recognized in the Peace and Friendship Treaties that were signed from 1725 to 1779. The series of treaties did not surrender indigenous land, resources, or sovereignty to the British Empire, but instead established rules for an ongoing relationship between nations. The treaties were later reaffirmed by Canada in Section 35 of the Constitution Act and remain active to this day. The NSCSW joins our members and our com communities in the labor of reconciliation. We are grateful to live and work together as treaty people in Mi'kma'ki. As we come together to discuss and collaborate on, critical, on the critical issues at hand, let us be mindful of, of the ongoing process of reconciliation and the importance of building respectful relationships. We commit to learning from the wisdom of Indigenous peoples, acknowledging the injustices caused by our profession, and working towards a more inclusive and equitable future for all. It's important to recognize the complex legacy of colonialism in Nova Scotia. The pervasive forms of racism that spawned, including anti-Black racism towards the descendants of those brought to this land through transatlantic slave trade and not relegated to history, but are experienced daily. Our values require us to recognize the ways in which many forms of oppression are interconnected through colonization, including racism, but also through ableism, misogyny, homophobia, biphobia, and transphobia. Recognition is a step towards uh, repair re uh, and righted relationships, and knowledge provides a basis for action. Again, I'd like to welcome you to this event. Thank you for your presence and engagement. We look forward to a productive and hopefully hopeful gathering as we collectively strive to create meaningful change in our communities. Uh, my name is Alex Stratford. I am your host for today's event. I'm also delighted to introduce our esteemed speakers. Uh, so Lynn Brogan uh, serves as the president of the NSCSW with an impressive background spanning over 30 years in human services field. 
Throughout her career, she has had several senior executive positions with the government and has been instrumental in leading transformative uh, strategic change initiatives aimed at providing the quality of life for Nova Scotians. And Dennis Duve uh, also joins us today. He is the director and co-owner of Wisdom to Action, consulting firm uh, committed uh, as a social enterprise uh, with expertise in various areas such as gender justice, children's rights, and mental health. Dennis's academic and professional background makes him an invaluable resource in facilitating positive change and strengthening communities. Both Lynn and Dennis will share their insights and experience during today's presentations. I will also provide some comments on how we will use this report, after which we will open the floor to questions. Uh, we do have a few members of media joining us today, so we're going to uh, 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 get them to ask some questions first, uh, and then it will be followed up to uh, anyone in the room. Uh, to ask a question, two ways to do that uh, is uh, if you want to use the uh, reaction function in the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, to raise your hand or uh, to put a question in the chat. We'll do our best to get to all of them as we engage in this important discussion. Friends, it's now my privilege to introduce Lynn Brogan, uh, the president of NSTSW, who will explain the motivations behind commissioning this report. Uh, I, again, I'm, uh, as Lynn shares the reasons why the NSTSW commissioned this report and highlights its significance in addressing the challenges faced by our communities, we invite you to reflect, reflect on the importance of collaboration and advocacy in promoting the well-being of children and families in Nova Scotia. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Lynn for some opening remarks. Thank you, Alec. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today as we discuss the critical issue of children's rights and family well-being in Nova Scotia. I am Lynn Brogan, and I'm president of the Council of the Nova Scotia College of Social Workers. As many of you know, our organization exists to serve and protect Nova Scotians by effectively regulating the profession of social work. As part of our mandate, we also Nova Scotians to advocate for policies that improve social conditions and challenge injustices and inequalities. We commissioned this child welfare report with a strong sense of moral and ethical obligation, driven by our commitment to advocate for the well-being of vulnerable children and families in Nova Scotia. It is our responsibility as professionals to understand the challenges faced by our communities and work tirelessly to improve the child welfare system in our province. Addressing children's rights and family well being is not only necessary, but it is an integral to fostering social justice and ensuring that every individual can thrive in our province. Given social work's legacy in the genocide of Indigenous peoples, we have a moral obligation to do so. Everything in our power to stop the harm and act toward healings which is crucial, crucial to reconciliation. For many years, I will tell you that the largest volume of complaints made to the college has come from the field of child welfare, with much of the complaints stemming from structural issues, such as the moral distress of social workers, lack of mentorship, training, support, workload issues, and the lack of required resources, both human resources and program services related. Working in the field of child welfare, and I know this firsthand, is one of the most complex and challenging areas of employment for social workers. The work is difficult, it's demanding, stressful, and unfortunately, often unsupported and devalued. Social workers in the field often face an incredible amount of criticism and are often unfairly targeted and blamed for when things go wrong. We know, however, that professional conduct is significantly shaped and influenced by the structures within which individuals operate, as these organizational frameworks establish the norms, the policies and expectations that guide their actions. The literature and our experience tell us time and time again that factors such as workplace culture, leadership styles, regulatory standards and guidelines, and the availability of resources are just some of the key factors that contribute to defining the parameters of acceptable behavior and decision-making processes. Moreover, these structures often determine the extent to which professionals can exercise autonomy, practice within their full scope, 
collaborate, communicate with colleagues, and operate in an environment of continuous learning and development. As a result, it is crucial for organizations to foster supportive and inclusive environments that promote ethical social work practices, open communication and collaboration, and cultivate positive supporting learning environments to enable professionals to better be equipped to navigate and the complexities of their work, maintain high levels of competencies, and ultimately deliver services that align with their profession and with the best interests of the individuals and communities they serve. The role of the college as a regulator is crucial in fostering collaboration to understand the interests of the people we serve, particularly the most vulnerable members of society. And we believe and experience that by actively engaging with the public, the social workers, community organizations, and importantly, those directly affected by the issues at hand, the college has gained valuable insights into the unique needs and concerns of these vulnerable populations. This collaborative approach is aimed at gathering important perspectives and is intended to allow the college to develop, implement, and advocate for policies and practices that genuinely address the needs of the communities that we serve. Ensuring accountability for the most vulnerable is essential as it is not only builds trust, but it also reinforces the commitment of the college to ensure Nova Scotians receive the services of ethically competent social workers. And by fostering collaboration and maintaining accountability, the college aims to promote a more equitable and just society for all, particularly for those most in need of protection and advocacy. Our areas of focus and project work as outlined in our strategic plan focuses on key areas such as poverty, housing, mental health, and child welfare. Such a strategic focus allows us to be labor, laser focused on key areas impacting vulnerable Nova Scotians and to identify gaps in existing frameworks, in existing policies and practices, and develop targeted strategies to create a more equitable, nurturing, and empowering environment for those that encounter our system. By doing so, we aim to ensure that the rights of children are upheld and that families receive the support that they need to overcome adversity and to build resilience. This is a vital component of our ethical commitment as professionals, as we strive to provide services that are grounded in empathy, in compassion, and a deep understanding of the unique needs of strengths of each individual and families we serve. You know, it's been two months since the Mass Casualty Commission released its final report, and the stories and testimony shared in turning the tide together paints a bleak picture of society's values, priorities, and capacity for empathy but they also illuminate a pathway for a brighter future. Hope is possible through understanding these stories and embracing our capacity for change. We heard throughout this particular consultation process, like the Turning the Tide Together report highlights of the need for systemic transformation of systems of safety. We heard that this will require changes to the child welfare system that includes a total review of its current governance structure, legislation, revised policies and models of practice, the need for enhanced communication and collaboration amongst communities, frontline staff and community organizations, and the need to value, properly train, support and resource those social workers who are to be commended for working in this very difficult field and for the need for new investments, new funding that's required to enable child and family well being in Nova Scotia. We also heard throughout this consultation process of the critical connection between poverty, housing insecurity, and the well being of children and families. Poverty is not an inevitable or natural occurrence 
but it rather is a political choice resulting from policy decisions that prioritize certain interests over the needs of vulnerable populations. We know addressing poverty and housing insecurity is essential for promoting the safety and well being of children and their families in this province. Tackling poverty requires structural changes that challenge the status quo and shift the focus toward creating more equitable and inclusive societies. This includes implementing recommendations from the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, Housing for All Report, and the Child and Family Report Card, both of which call for comprehensive measures to eliminate child poverty and ensure access to safe, affordable housing for all. Through collaborative efforts among partners and collaborators, including social workers, policymakers, community organizations, individuals and families directly impacted by poverty, we really can create meaningful change and improve the well-being of children and families in Nova Scotia. By doing so, we reaffirm our commitment to social justice and the fundamental belief that everyone deserves an opportunity to live free from poverty, from violence, and insecurity. As we move forward, the college remains committed to working with our members, with government, employers, community groups, and citizens to build a stronger social work community and advance the social work profession in Nova Scotia. Together, I believe, we believe that we can create lasting change that benefits children, families, and communities. Friends, it is now my pleasure to introduce Dennis Stubing, PhD, who will identify key findings and recommendations of what they heard during their consultation process, drawing from his extensive expertise in children's rights, policy analysis, and international development. Dennis has played a crucial, integral role in shaping this report and ensuring that it reflects the voices of the most impacted by the issues at hand. As Dennis shares the insights gathered from our communities and outlines the recommendations for moving forward, we encourage you to listen closely and consider how these findings can inform our collective efforts to create meaningful change. So without further ado, please welcome me in joining Dennis Stewing. Dennis? Hey everyone, thanks very much Lynn for the introduction uh, and the kind words. Uh, I'm sharing my screen now. Uh, I speak very quickly uh, and I'm going to do my best to slow down uh, because there's a lot to cover today, but I want to do justice to the material. Um, but we have slides here, so hopefully that will help fill in the gaps as I speak quickly. Um, I want to echo Alex's comment earlier that I hope everyone is safe and uh, faring through these difficult times. Uh, and is coming to this presentation able to uh, absorb what we have to share with you today. Um, really excited by the opportunity to be here, really excited that Nova Scotia College of Social Workers entrusted Wisdom to Action with the opportunity to engage stakeholders in the development of the report, Building an Ecosystem to Achieve Child and Family Wellbeing. Once again, my name is Dennis Steubing. I'm director and co-owner of Wisdom to Action, a consulting firm here in Nova Scotia. Uh, I'm calling in from the traditional and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq in Pennewick, Mi'kma'ki, which is also known as Kenfield, Nova Scotia, and pronouns are he, him, his. Um, there we go, look at that, it even worked. Uh, so by way of the way we developed the paper, the reports that we're here to talk about today, uh, I wanna walk you through the steps that we took. Um, so the methodology that was used to develop the paper. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we wanted to create, and we did create a youth advisory council to help guide the process. Uh, so that Youth Advisory Council was uh, a group of young people um, from across the province uh, that uh, came together to provide their insight and lived experience to the process. Uh, those young people were no longer part of the uh, child welfare system. They had a history uh, to be able to share their um, from their perspective. Um, that's a piece of the type of work that we do at Wisdom to Action is to ensure those who are most affected uh, by issues that we're working on are engaged in part of the process. So uh, the Youth Advisory Council was formed and assisted us uh, throughout. We then launched into a literature review. So we looked at legislation, number of other different pieces of literature that helped us to position our understanding 
uh, more intensely uh, around uh, what is going on, what has gone on historically in the child welfare system in Nova Scotia. So really dug in and tried to understand that. And then from that moved forward in surveying stakeholders. So we sent out two surveys, one that was oriented towards service providers from the child, uh, child welfare system, uh, and then service recipients. So uh, folks who had some sort of experience uh, with the child welfare system. Uh, from that, we then moved on to develop focus groups. So we had two focus groups, again, divided between those two groups. Uh, and then uh, we looked at all of that information that came through from the literature, from the surveys, and from the focus groups. And we did an uh, analysis uh, for emergent themes. Um, and those emergent themes are the ones that we'll be presenting here today uh, in a very brief version of what is contained within the, the broader report. Uh, we drafted that report. And then that report was uh, verified by uh, stakeholders through a number of uh, Zoom sessions where we engaged with uh, yeah, stakeholders from across the province to ensure that the final product that you now will have access to um, has been vetted, has been further refined and has been honed based on uh, lived experience, based on um, stakeholder perspectives to ensure that uh, what we're actually providing is very sound um, having gone through that verification process. So by way of the findings and the emergent themes, um, I'll just give you a quick uh, overview of the, the seven themes and then walk you through a little bit more information around what those themes actually are and then the recommendations that came from those themes. Uh, so the child welfare system in Nova Scotia lacks impact uh, or impactful change. Uh, it's rooted in colon uh, colonialism, racism, and sexism. It's punitive in nature. It lacks prevention. It needs to address poverty as a root cause of many of the issues that are part and parcel to what we'll talk about today. Uh, there is a lack of collaboration and communication across the system's parts. Uh, and there's a lack of value placed on social work in child welfare. Uh, so those are the, the seven key themes that came out of the process uh, of, of the stakeholder engagement and the analysis. And I'll just now walk you through what those actually mean. So by way of lack of impactful change, uh, DCS embarked on a transformational journey to make uh, service delivery, I'm just gonna adjust something here, there we go. Uh, service delivery more effective and efficient with the support of external contractors, uh, but that didn't uh, improve outcomes for children and youth uh, and families. Uh, Nova Scotia's child welfare system needs to reform further due to bureaucracy, complexity, disconnection, poor outcomes, inadequate regulation and accountability, and a lack of data gathering technology. And some of that was, was covered by Lynn in, in her comments. Um, to, oh, oh, there we go. Uh, to address that, uh, we recommend that there is a review of the current governance structure and that an, a minister is appointed solely to focus on improving outcomes for children, youth, uh, families, and caregivers. Uh, and that a chief officer position is created in that new structure that should be created, uh, that a transfer occurs of certain positions from the current structure of DCS to the new structure, and then an allocation of $2.5 million for an Office of Child and Family Wellbeing, and $3.8 million for, a, uh, for family group conferencing and immediate response conferencing team coordinator positions. We also recommend the investment of $750,000 in the office annually, uh, to create an ecosystem for child and family well-being. Uh, there needs to be legislation that needs to uh, be established for the framework that will guide the work of the office. Uh, core funding needs to be provided for service providers rather than just grant fundings that are by project so that uh, organizations and service providers can continue to function on an ongoing basis sustainably rather than just on the one-off for projects. Uh, we recommend creating four community oversight boards with a legislative mandate and funding, uh, and that those boards uh, consider the existing regional boundaries of other service, uh, services that are provided, and so that there can be alignment uh, where it makes the best sense for alignment to occur, uh, but that, that that takes into consideration cultural uh, contexts and realities across the province. We also recommend the creation of anonymous feedback mechanism on the governance of that office so that uh, service providers in particular who the key funding uh, have the ability to be able to speak to inadequacies or inefficiencies or problems that occur uh, without fear of impact on their funding uh, that they receive. 
Okay, by way of the uh, theme of uh, the system being rooted in colonialism, racism, and sexism, uh, racism is deeply embedded within the child welfare system, depriving children of a safe and discrimination-free environment. The 2017 Child and Family Services Act had an adverse impact on marginalized communities. And just wanna be explicit here, when we're talking about marginalized communities, we're talking about black, uh, indigenous, and racialized communities. Uh, due to the intrusive investigations and oversight of those communities. So in terms of recommendations to address that theme or that issue, uh, we recommend amending the Children and Family Services Act with a trauma-informed and culturally safe provisions, that, we, uh, that providing discretion for judges to make access orders uh, be a, a priority, uh, continuing the African Nova Scotian Bachelor of Social Work cohort, uh, prioritizing diverse cultural backgrounds in hiring processes and ensuring that those folks that do get hired on have safer uh, contexts in which they can work. Uh, and then ensuring that resources are allocated to support expectant families. By way of the theme of uh, the system being punitive in nature, we want you to understand that child welfare policies and services are punitive, standardized and surveillance oriented with inadequate guidance for effective social work practice. The system needs to move away from these outdated values and shift towards hu uh, more human-centered service uh, provision. Um, there's a lot here uh, and, and really want to encourage folks to read the report because I can't really do justice in the very limited amount of time that we have to talk about all of the specifics around how the punitive nature uh, is expected by children and families and caregivers. So really do encourage you to dig in here. But by way of uh, the recommendations, a developing policy based on child well-being practice framework that we in the, the paper, uh, as well as anti-racist principles embedded throughout. Amending policies to be less rules-driven, uh, utilizing models such as the one from New Brunswick on immediate response conferencing, uh, prioritizing kinship and community caregivers over foster care options uh, so that young people who uh, need support outside of their, their family uh, have it in a broader sense within their family or within their community as opposed to the uh, impacts that young people experience when they're pulled from community altogether to go to a foster care situation in another, uh, another context or community. Uh, so creating an office of a children's lawyer within the Department of Justice, extending services to youth aging out of care up to the age of 27 with additional supports. Uh, and then in terms of the theme around lack of prevention, um, we want to understand that uh, currently woefully insufficient resources are allocated to child and family well-being, which have left vulnerable children and families, particularly those from historically disadvantaged communities. And again, we wanna be explicit here. We're talking about black, indigenous and racialized communities. Uh, we want that to be known so that it's not just um, these broader terms that get used, uh, but cloak the reality of, of what's going on at the community level. So for those who are historically disadvantaged to ensure that they've got adequate resources because right now the prevention on the prevention side, that's inadequate. In terms of recommendations then, how we recommend uh, uh, the, that be addressed, um, we recommend a principle of universality should be embraced to provide access, accessible services to all. $80 million uh, minimum increase immediately and $30 million within three years for mental health systems should be made to meet the needs of Nova Scotians with a focus on prevention. Uh, and oversight of policy 75 should be implemented for service allocation with evaluation of quality and individual need alignment. Additionally, uh, orientation of mental health to bio, psycho, social, spiritual model, gender affirming services, uh, community and culturally appropriate services, for marginalized groups, public health expansion uh, is also recommended. And again, mar marginalized groups here, we don't wanna uh, um, gloss over the fact that we're talking about black, indigenous, and racialized communities, but this could be other marginalized group as well, including uh, people with disabilities as well as 2SLGBTQ folks. Um, clear amalgamate, clearly amalgamating the strategy for mental health and addiction services so that these two things aren't separate and uh, disparate, but that we cross um, the silos that are often existing in terms of um, those services with a harm reduction strategy employed in substance use counseling and then control drinking and as an option, abstinence is not possible. Uh, we recognize in the report and in the paper uh, 
that we need to address poverty as a root cause, right? So root, uh, poverty and housing insecurity are seen as the root of many of the issues that burden our child welfare systems. Uh, the effects on intervention, reunification, safety, and well-being are substantial. Uh, structural changes are needed to address these underlying problems to ensure par positive results for all involved. And that's something that Lynn also uh, mentioned in uh, her comments. Recommendations to address that then. Uh, the Housing for All reports 94 recommendations must be implemented and 33,000 units of permanently affordable housing need to be built or acquired and maintained. An additional 531 million per year should be dedicated to operational spending over 10 years. The 16 recommendations for the uh, 2022 uh, Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives, Nova Scotia Child and Family Report Card should also be implemented. And placements of children in temporary care should pr prioritize kinship and or community of care options uh, based on class impacts. Uh, so another one of the themes, uh, as I mentioned from the outset, is a lack of collaboration and communication within the child welfare system itself and across the child welfare system. So bureaucratic systems, policies that restrict communication, and moral distress and burnout among staff have created a worrisome gap in collaboration between social services, health systems, and justice institutions, which is preventing vulnerable populations from receiving the support they deserve. Again, want to point out vulnerable populations. Here we're talking about in particular, Black, Indigenous, and racialized communities, as well as uh, people with disabilities and 2SLGBTQ populations. Um, as such, measures must be taken to create a better connected network of stakeholders that can work together harmoniously for more positive outcomes. This is something that came up in our, our stakeholder engagement, was that the system doesn't communicate with itself, and there's no uh, or very little uh, collaboration between, our, uh, between stakeholders. So that, that's a really vital uh, aspect of a system and its function, right, is they, they need to actually come together and work together. Recommendation, recommendations to address then that shortfall are that managers from the Office of Child and Family Wellbeing, this structure that we've recommended earlier, should remove administrative barriers and facilitate collaboration amongst stakeholders. Nova Scotia should set up an interdepartmental working group to ensure better communication between child welfare stakeholders. So that could be more than one interdepartmental departmental working group, for example, at different levels. That could be senior managers, that can be um, uh, at the ministerial level, uh, but that there should be these mechanisms that facilitate uh, and foster that communication and collaboration that is necessary at the governmental level interdepartmentally. An investment is needed of $200,000 in inclusion, diversity, community relations, and 21 million in universal childcare. Uh, establish 15 new child care centers with 500 spaces prioritizing rural areas and implement peer-based supports within the child welfare system. Finally, in terms of the emergent themes, uh, as Lynn mentioned again at the outset, is the lack of value placed on social work in child welfare. So social work within child welfare, within the child welfare system, has been subject to a diminishing value. Uh, with social workers increasingly expected to serve as case managers rather than draw upon their valuable experience and expertise in working with children, youth, and families, their holistic perspective, child rights focus, and child and family-centered lens. It is vital now more than ever for social work to be deemed as an essential service and for employers to recognize and value the role and scope of practice of social workers in their staffing complement, not only in frontline service delivery positions, but in management and senior leadership positions. To address that then, we recommend Nova Scotia should create a defined set of competencies for social work in the child welfare system in line with provincial standards. Roles and responsibilities for education, training and support, including mentorship should be clearly defined. Uh, and the Child Welfare League of America's caseload workload standards should be adopted requiring an investment of uh, $3.8 million. Family support workers, case aides, and mental health clinicians should be assigned to teams of supervisors and social workers. An independent regulatory body for social workers should be created to uh, protect the public. Social workers must be deemed essential, like police officers and nurses, and positions must be filled quickly as soon as vacancies occur, as opposed to those things lingering for long HR processes, but ensuring that um, uh, they're addressed immediately. And critical incident debriefing must be provided and post-traumatic stress should be 
uh, should have a presumption when accessing services through the Workers' Compensation Board, as opposed to the administrative, administrative hurdles that uh, uh, social workers face when they try to um, access those services. Uh, once again, it's been a real pleasure to be able to work with Nova Scotia College of Social Workers on this project. Really uh, want to encourage folks to take the time uh, to review the report in its fullness because uh, what I've covered here today is very minimal compared to what is in the broader report. And uh, just want to express my gratitude uh, for you coming to this uh, event today to hear about um, what we've suggested here. Thanks very much and I'll hand it back. Friends, um, <clears throat> sorry, we'll just switch the spotlight there. Uh, thank you. Uh, friends, thank you for joining us today as we discuss the impact of this report and the need to cultivate hope for all involved. I stand before you as a social worker, experience firsthand the challenges faced by our colleagues, the families we serve, and the communities we work in. It's important to note that the current child welfare system in Nova Scotia is deeply entrenched in a model that has remained largely unchanged for the past 100 years. This antiquated approach, which can be tracked back to animal protection policies, continues to face significant criticism, uh, has eroded public trust, and has eroded public trust in government services. The persistence of stories that paint a negative picture of the system has only exacerbated the situation, leading to increased frustration among social workers who feel misunderstood and morally distressed. As these stories continue to surface, the public's perception of social work as a profession is negatively impacted. Social workers are frequently portrayed as uncaring or indifferent, when in reality they are often bound by systemic constraints and complex situations that require different political decisions to be made. This misrepresentation of the roles and responsibilities fosters a sense of disillusionment, both within the profession and among the general pub public. The erosion of trust in social work has far-reaching consequences. It undermines the credibility of social workers, making it more challenging for them to effectively advocate for and support the families they serve. In turn, this can lead to decreased collaboration between social workers, other professionals, and community members, ultimately hindering the provision of comprehensive and effective services for vulnerable children and families. Moreover, the lack of understanding about the complexities of social work can deter potential new practitioners from entering the field, further perpetuating challenges faced by the profession. As a result, there's an urgent need for a shift in public perception and a renewed focus on the vital role of social workers uh, it, and supporting them uh, in the well being of children and families in our communities. To address this issue, it's essential to promote transparency and open dialogue about the realities of social work and the challenges faced by practitioners in delivering these core and essential services. By fostering a greater understanding of the complexities inherent in the profession, we can work towards rebuilding trust in the child welfare system and empowering social workers to continue advocating for transformative change. This will ultimately contribute to the creation of a more just, equitable, and supportive society for all. As the governing body for social workers, it's imperative that we work diligently to ensure that our professionals operate within a system that also comprehends and addresses the complexities they face daily. We must recognize the importance of fostering an environment that encourages continuous learning and reflection on the potential impact of unconscious bias on the clients that we serve. Social, works, social workers play a critical role in supporting vulnerable individuals and families, and it's essential that they are held accountable for understanding and mitigating the harm caused by unconscious bias and holding our systems accountable uh, for, again, the structural conditions that lead to that. These biases can have subtle influences on decision-making and interactions with clients and perpetuating systemic inequalities and adversely affecting the quality of care. To achieve this, the NSCSW must continue to invest in comprehensive training programs that focus on increasing self-awareness, promoting cultural safety, and enhancing an understanding of the diverse experiences and backgrounds of the clients we serve. By equipping social workers with the tools and knowledge necessary to recognize and address unconscious bias, we can foster a more inclusive and equitable process and system that respects the values of the unique needs and circumstances of each client. This commitment to continuous growth and learning will ensure that social workers remain accountable for their actions and decisions, ultimately leading to improved outcomes for individuals and families. As we face these challenges, it's essential to focus on hope. 
hope that this report will highlight the urgent need for transformation, uh, and for transformative change in the provision of child welfare. Hope that the intersections of poverty, domestic violence, and government policy that exasperate the effects of abuse and lessen positive outcomes for families, coupled with the clear struggles and violations of rights of the LGBTQ 2 SIA communities happening in our school systems right now, and all other forms uh, of oppression directed uh, at racialized groups can be changed. I am hopeful that our government, the Minister of Community Services, uh, will legislate a reduction and then elimination of child uh, poverty and engage in work to tackle, uh, again, uh, the, the direct impact on child well-being. By addressing past political decisions and ensuring that we build an ecosystem with social programs that support the most vulnerable citizens, we can make a real difference in the lives and families uh, of Nova Scotians. Pathways to healing from intergenerational poverty and trauma necessitate a collective effort from all, including government, communities, and individuals. The evidence is clear that government income support programs play a crucial role in building dignity, capacity, and empowering family well-being. By providing financial assistance and resources to those in need, you can help alleviate the burden of poverty and its associated stressors, creating an environment where families can thrive and break the cycle of intergenerational trauma. By investing in income support programs such as affordable housing, initiatives, childcare, uh, the government can directly contribute to the creation of more equitable and resilient communities. These initiatives not only help to reduce the immediate effects of poverty, but also empower families to develop skills, knowledge, and resources to overcome long-term challenges, build a brighter future for themselves and children. Furthermore, it's important to acknowledge that healing from intergenerational uh, trauma requires a multifaceted approach that goes beyond just financial assistance. This includes investing in culturally appropriate mental health services, community-based supports, and reconciliation efforts that promote understanding, empathy, and healing for those affected by trauma. However, we must also acknowledge the shortcomings of the current legislation, such as the amended Children and Family Services Act. Uh, which has been flawed and needs to be transformed through direct engagements and listening to families and clients affected by the system. My hope is that a transformative act will uphold the principles of least intrusive intervention while providing support for well-being of families and protecting the youth. With deep engagement from government, we can create an act that removes the worst aspects of social control and carceral logics while ensuring the tools are in place to provide services that lead to overall well-being. As we work toward, as we work together to bring about meaningful change, let us remember that hope is a powerful force. It inspires us to challenge the status quo, advocate for policies that uplift vulnerable communities, and ultimately create a more equitable society. As social workers, we have a unique opportunity to lead the way in this crucial work, cultivating hope, not only for ourselves, but also for families and the communities we serve. It's important to note that change does not just happen. It requires persistent advocacy and a steadfast commitment to the pursuit of social justice. It's important to remember that government is meant to work in the interests of all Nova Scotians, especially the most vulnerable among us. As citizens, professionals, and community members, it is our collective responsibility to hold our government accountable and ensure that they prioritize the needs and well-being of those who are often marginalized or overlooked. By raising our voices, sharing our experiences, and working together, we can advocate for policies and programs that promote equity, inclusivity, and compassion. This involves engaging in open dialogue uh, with decision makers, collaborating with diverse partners and collaborators, and continuously pushing for transformative change uh, in the systems that impact the lives of vulnerable individuals and families. In our pursuit of a more just society, we must also recognize the power of collective action and the importance of building strong networks of support. By uniting our efforts and leveraging the unique strengths and perspectives of our community, we can amplify our collective message and drive meaningful progress towards our shared goals. Ultimately, it is through this unwavering commitment to advocacy and collaboration that we can create long-lasting change, ensuring that government works in the best interest of all Nova Scotians and fosters a brighter future for a generation to come. In closing, I want to express my gratitude for all of you being here today and for a commitment to making a difference in the lives of children and families in Nova Scotia. Together, we can transform challenges we face in opportunities for growth, healing, towards lasting change. Let us move forward with hope, courage, and determination to create a brighter future. Thank you all for coming. 
we are able to open up the floor to some questions. If there are um, uh, folks from the media in, um, in the gallery, we're happy to take your questions first. So I am gonna look at the chat um, as well as um, uh, uh, look for hands if there are any questions at all. So how um, Yvette has asked how unique are the perspective or are, are the recommendations here when we look at other Canadian jurisdictions. Um, as far as I uh, know, Yvette, most reports on child welfare um, stem from government initiated efforts. Um, there are not a lot of advocacy bodies um, like ourselves who have put together reports and recommendations like this. Where our report, I think, really uh, differentiates uh, between other reports is that we speak about what is possible. Um, everyone's getting that emergency alert. I know it's a distraction. Um, where we uh, really focus in on uh, here is, uh, again, uh, the presence of poverty, uh, uh, the, uh, its interconnection with family violence and child welfare issues, and the structural changes that need to happen in regards to how we view child and family well-being. I would uh, contest that most other recommendations focus more specifically uh, and uh, tactfully on programs and policies within the system. Ours takes a much broader approach uh, to looking at all of the pieces that are required to create well-being. Yeah, thanks for that, Jim. Uh, I'm just reading Jim's question there. Does this research explore how a child welfare program led and staffed by social workers has evolved into such an inhumane system? Universities have a role to play in preparing social workers for the kids and services that are being recommended. Uh, so your first question, uh, yes, there is a, a exploration of, of again, um, how decisions have been made to lead us uh, to, to this environment uh, that we are currently within. Um, again, much of that has to do with perceptions of poverty, valuations uh, of our current uh, neoliberal uh, constraints, um, focusing on individuals, holding and blaming individuals um, accountable for what are failures of the system. Uh, what we mean by that is, uh, again, when you add the layer of poverty uh, into the child welfare system, uh, particularly when you look at uh, the current provision of neglect as defined in the Children and Family Services Act, which speaks about, uh, again, the uh, failure to provide food, clothing, water, and emotional support. Um, what often happens in these contexts is, uh, again, when a family doesn't have the means and resources, uh, they are put under surveillance uh, by their communities um, and by uh, other professionals. Um, and there's often a general stigma um, and uh, uh, attached to uh, families living in poverty. Uh, then uh, again, because we have not provided the government supports uh, are, that are required to lift folks out of poverty, um, uh, the child welfare system steps in often punishing those who are victims of uh, failed government policy. Uh, that is uh, again, uh, how we've uh, led here in terms of the roles that folks must play. You know, one of the core recommendations that uh, Dennis made there uh, is that we uh, need to really define what is the skill set and the competencies that social workers working within the child welfare system are required to have, and that that exploration needs to be done uh, by all partners and collaborators, educators, ourselves, uh, the employer, uh, community members, to really define that and then determine, okay, who's going to be accountable for the education, who's going to be accountable for the training, who's going to be accountable for the mentoring, and how do we ensure oversight of all of that? Um, that is a core part of the recommendations here. Sorry, just trying to catch up with questions here. What can government do right now in this moment to address the understaffing and caseload numbers in child welfare? The lack of response to child welfare needs to address uh, already involved 
uh, in child welfare is significantly uh, impacted uh, because of these families. And these are often going uh, long periods of time without uh, contact, uh, without any sense of how they have moved. Uh, so uh, yeah, go for it. I think one of the things that are that's uh, critically important, what can government do right now? Um, two things certainly come to my mind immediately. Uh, one is that they must adopt the Child Welfare League of America standards with respect to caseload and workload. The current standard in the Child Protection Services Manual is over 30 years old with respect to a caseload standard. That in no way reflects the needs and the complexity of today's families that, that require uh, the services. So immediately, there needs to be a revision of that 1.1 standard uh, to reflect um, what the Child Welfare League of America recommends, which is consistent, I will say, with other national standards. This is moving to a caseload that looks like more 12 to 15 for children in care, no more than 18 uh, cases with respect to uh, protection social workers. Um, again, all of those caseloads need to have a balance of workload with respect to mild, uh, medium, and complex. Also, what needs to happen is an immediate, independent to government review of the caseload that social workers um, are finding themselves uh, dealing with. Uh, and that review um, needs to uh, occur. Um, certainly, that involves um, social workers uh, at the forefront. Uh, right now, in the field of social work in child welfare, there's a huge recruitment issue attraction issue, not just a retention issue. For years and years, it was about retaining uh, social workers within the field. Now it's actually about recruitment and retaining. And that speaks to um, the stresses uh, of the job, the need for uh, support. Um, I firmly believe that uh, child protection workers should not even be given a caseload until um, they receive the adequate training and support that they, they need. So those are two immediate pieces that government can do. Can you add to that, Alan? Yeah, the other thing I would add um, immediately is that much of the stress in all of our systems right now uh, is created by uh, the uh, converging crises of cost of living, uh, rising inequality, uh, and the climate crisis, which we are living uh, through today. Um, again, to take a massive strain off the system, which is what we saw worked very effectively uh, mm -hmm. during the pandemic, uh, is to immediately um, increase rates of income assistance to get people up to the poverty line. Um, income uh, is a protective factor. Uh, plain and simple, the evidence is overwhelming there. Income is also uh, a, a substantial indicator of, uh, of, of well-being uh, and a social determinant of health. Um, it's important to note that the government of Nova Scotia uh, had an unprecedented $1.5 billion of, uh, of uh, additional revenue last year. There are zero reasons uh, why that shouldn't have impacted uh, income assistance rates, uh, which would have alleviated a substantial amount of stress on all of our systems, which would at least give us some breathing room uh, to start to implement some of these broader systemic changes. I think also one of the things that's highlighted in the report, again, something that, thank you for your question, that government can immediately do, we've talked about this for years, is deem the profession of social work and child protection as essential services. What this does is it addresses issues such as filling of vacancies, expediting vacancies, not using social work positions in any vacancy factor. So really prioritizing the need to have adequate numbers of social workers doing this very complex hard job. Uh, Dennis, I see your hands up. Did you wanna comment here? Yeah, just really quickly wanted to add two minor points. Uh, one of which is building on what has just been said and uh, the importance of uh, 
um, income assistance. Uh, looking at uh, this from a children's rights perspective, uh, really clearly uh, recommended through the Convention on the Rights of the Child as well to ensure that young, uh, young people benefit from uh, mechanisms like income assistance. So this is like connected again to part of our framework that we did in developing the paper, which uh, is a children's rights lens. So making sure that we understand it and acknowledge that that piece is there, it's part of human rights, uh, particularly children's rights. And I just wanted to step back to Yvette's uh, question regarding the uniqueness or the recommendations being connected to other Canadian jurisdictions and add that some of our stakeholders that were engaged in the process of developing this uh, report um, had experience in other jurisdictions as well. So they were able to be able to speak to consistencies and coherence across provinces and jurisdictions uh, to ensure that some of what we were recommending reflected best practice or uh, uh, informative practice from other places so that these recommendations were um, coherent, co cohesive, and, and getting us to a better place and envisioning what the child welfare system could look like. So just wanted to add those two things and thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for that, Dennis. Really important thing. Yeah, I think this is a really important, uh, sorry, I'm just reading the chat, I'll read it out loud. I uh, should have done that. Child protection is rarely part of the public discourse in Nova Scotia. Public is mostly ignorant to the issues that report, uh, the report examines. How do we change and bring public pressure to bear uh, on many shortcomings of the child welfare system? Yeah, I think this is part of the challenge that we face, Brian, um, in terms of getting the political attention that is required to transform the system, uh, is that it is often disconnected and isolated. Uh, and, you know, here's the, here's the thing, which, which you know, is that um, the majority of Nova Scotians, particularly those with power and privilege, would not be involved in the child welfare system. Um, this is often the challenge we have when delivering public policy and, and uh, uh, making uh, political decisions, um, is that it is often those with the most power uh, and the loudest voice who are able to, um, to who are able to uh, bring this to light and discourse. So I, I do want to um, give uh, kudos to this current government, who I believe is moving towards um, being able to rectify this in some way. Um, and that is through the creation of a Child Youth Commission, um, which we are hopeful will come online this year uh, with legislation table. Um, again, we as an organization have been doing our best to uh, engage in public discourse to try and get Nova Scotians to pay attention. Uh, but again, our, our mandate is um, uh, broad and encompasses a number of things. So uh, again, the due attention needed um, that we're not able to provide. Uh, and that's where a Child Youth Commission will come into play, uh, who will be able to capture the stories, uh, be able to listen directly to youth um, who are impacted by these systems and be able to elevate their voices into the political and public discourse. Um, it is crucial that we have that system come online uh, soon uh, so that we can continue to see that change. Uh, so Janet has asked the question, what do you think is most critical from a social work education perspective uh, in preparing social work students going into the field? You want to tackle that one, Lynn? Absolutely. I'll, I'll start from the very basics. Um, you know, again, one of the recommendations really talks about, you know, what are the roles and the responsibilities in terms of, um, you know, universities um, and employers, I would say one of the first things is we have to get back to basics, folks, with respect to learnings um, in a social work program. We need to talk about and understand child development, family, individual and family dynamics. Uh, we need to, to really focus on interviewing, you know, skills, giving social workers those basics um, to ground them um, in the importance of what being vulnerable is, um, understanding issues uh, of those individuals that will come to their attention. What does living in poverty mean? That's right. 
those are pieces that will prepare individuals before they're even given a caseload. So first of all, let's get down to the basics and then really understand those individuals that they are going to serve and the issues that those individuals face every single day. I would add that, uh, you know, uh, being a professional um, uh, and being particularly regulated as a professional uh, means, uh, uh, again, many things, but ultimately it means uh, accountability to the public that we serve. Um, and uh, again, a particular lens and value set that we bring forward. Um, what I think is really important here is uh, within the child welfare system that we recognize is that many of the decisions are based uh, on uh, the judgment of social workers utilizing, again, the education, the school, um, the, uh, the skills, uh, and their own set of values uh, that move through. And one of the major challenges we see, and has been noted by many people involved in this paper, um, as well as publicly, um, is that oftentimes we uh, view family uh, from uh, the, a very white-centric lens. Um, those are some of the pieces that need to be start to have broken down um, and start to be reassessed. And, and in order to do that, um, this comes back to Lynn's core point about workloads and caseloads, um, is the provision of care, uh, I, I know many people in the room uh, understand this well, um, is not a, a simple or easy task. It is quite complicated. It is loaded in our ability to uh, draw on our knowledge, um, on our skill set, uh, and on our values, critically self-reflect, continue to look at theory and drive it into practice. That takes time to develop. That takes time to be able to uh, figure out the nuances of the skill set in that. Um, so again, when we talk about the recommendation involving uh, defining the competencies and who's responsible. A big piece of that is how do we mentor uh, social workers? Uh, how do we lead social workers? How do we support social workers to make these complex judgments? What does that look like um, with, within our current system? Um, and how do we support that? And how do we, how do we allow um, social workers when they enter the field and when they continue in the field to actually practice within their full scope. Mm -hmm. That's pretty darn hard um, when you have excessive workload and caseload challenges that uh, and policies that are over a thousand pages, um, you're forced to practice from a checkbox mm -hmm. mentality rather than the full scope of, of uh, why you entered, you know, this field in the first place. Yeah. And so, uh, Janet, I appreciate that question. Um, it Very starts with question. a solid education, um, but then it moves through into the specific training, uh, mentorship and support, uh, all that are required there. Uh, and again, uh, the other thing, too, and, and I've raised this point a number of times, um, is that, uh, again, I'll, I'll use medicine as an example. When a, a surgeon is performing a surgery, um, they have many tools at their disposal to do that. Other professionals, nurses, other parts of the team, equipment, um, assessment uh, tools, all of that is present. When a social worker is looking to put together a really meaningful and uh, purposeful um, plan with families uh, and parents, it is essential that they also have the tools to be able to do that. And the tools to do that in this setting are those social uh, 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 social programs that are in place, meaningful income assistance, adequate housing, um, all of that. Those are the tools that social workers require as well. And that's what our report tries to address in addition to that. Thanks for that comment, Maria. Okay. So folks, um, I'm, I'm seeing lots of good discussion and please note that this is um, uh, a continuation of ongoing discussions that we've had. There will be more events, um, more advocacy and much more planned around this important conversation. 
we are going to leave it at that today. Um, we really want to thank you for coming out. Uh, and uh, uh, especially given what's going on in not even the world in our backyard today. Um, we feel for the families uh, and all involved uh, who are being impacted uh, by the convergence of uh, climate crisis um, uh, and uh, affordability issues uh, that are really bearing out today. Um, I hope that everyone stays safe. I hope that you have good support uh, and I hope that you find hope uh, today in, in uh, what we've uh, recommended here and the continuation for further advocacy uh, and hopefully transformative change. Uh, thanks for joining us and uh, have a, uh, a safe day. Thanks, thanks everyone. So